without further ado, our special guest, the Mayor, John Tory. Well, Jason, thank you very much, and uh, I'll stand in my own place here, because this is where I sit. It says I sit up there, but we have a speaker who normally sits up there and runs the council meetings. I should say, Alex, you should be perhaps slightly concerned that you are sitting in the seat of Councillor Giorgio Mammoliti, who once from that very seat advocated that we should have a brothel on Toronto Island. <laughs> and as for those of you who are laughing hard at that sitting up there, that's where the media normally sits, and I will say nothing more about that. Um, I am delighted that you're here. And you know, you don't normally think of City Hall as a place that you would come uh, to, uh, to as, as the place of innovation. And, and we should change that. We have to change that. And I'm in the process of trying to change that with, uh, with a team of people here, both public servants and elected representatives. I've just come from a room downstairs where I was sitting listening to deputations being made on the budget. The public is a chance they have to come in at the different civic centers around the city and make their views known on the budget. And if you uh, were to have been in there, and the, it's going on as we speak, to listen to what they were talking about, they were mostly talking about very human problems. Child care, mental health, housing. Uh, these are things that uh, you know, affect people in their daily lives, especially those who are sometimes marginalized and on the outside looking in. And in the end, I'm one of those who believes the best way we're going to remedy that is, yes, through programs that the government has and through the ingenuity of the private sector and through the engagement of citizens. But in the end, it has to be funded by prosperity. And I happen to believe going forward that while we have a wonderful economy here that is, that is predicated on the continued existence, as I'm sure will be the case, of a strong financial services sector, a strong life sciences sector, a strong IT sector, and on down the list I could go, that is going to be driven in terms of its growth going forward and I think in terms of its survival, but its growth going forward to look at it in the most optimistic way by the activities that take place uh, as a result of the efforts of people in this room, the success they have as people who are entrepreneurs and risk takers and people with ideas. I heard it said uh, at an Ontario Economic Summit I went to probably four or five years ago and they were talking even then about the world of work which as we know has changed so much and not all for the better. But they were talking about the world of work and the precariousness of employment and, and so on. And, and somebody said, and I wish I could remember who it was because I've repeated it so often, I'd love to have given them credit for something I think that was very wise, which is that the premium that will be placed on the education system, on the training initiatives that we undertake, should be placed on teaching people how to create a job, especially for themselves, as opposed to how to get a job. Because a lot of the people in this room, and it's something that I admire and I want to see emulated and repeated and duplicated over and over and over again because I believe we must and we should, it's how we're going to get the best out of ourselves, are in many cases doing something to create a job for themselves initially and to create an enterprise to take an idea and use that to create a job for others. And in order for us, to, we're doing well at this. I mean, if you look at the rankings, I, I, ha I brought it with me because on, on uh, the ecosystem ranking from uh, Compass uh, Company's Global Startup uh, ranking in 2015, we are uh, the largest in Canada in terms of, an e of a startup ecosystem and in the top 20. And I think our ratings have sometimes gone as high as uh, second or third in North America and quite high up even above the halfway mark of the top 20 in the world. But it really is going to require considerable additional change on our part in what I call both attitude and approach going forward if we're going to make sure that, th that, that the kind of uh, enterprise, the kind of risk taking, the kind of startup uh, welcoming environment uh, that is going to be necessary for your success and for our success is really there in terms of people really meaning it and in terms of people actually making it happen. On the attitude side, it is going to require an even greater push to embrace change. No human beings really like change all that much, I think, if we sort of are candid about it. But in particular, when it either affects a vested interest or when it affects a comfortable pattern that people have adopted in their business or their personal life, um, it even becomes something that is resisted to a greater extent. I don't support uh, Uber because I wanted to pick sides. And when I say I support Uber, I have not sounded balanced, I hope I have, in my approach to this very complicated, very difficult issue because I somehow have some problem with the taxi cab industry or because I'm even a partisan in favor of Uber. What I'm in favor of is the idea that people can and should and must be developing, and I want as many of them as possible to be developed here 
disruptive technologies, technologies that move us forward, technologies that are inevitable in many respects, and you know more, far more about this than I do. And all I have said, and the thing that got people aggravated from day one, even before I was sworn in as the mayor, but when I was elected, as I said, look, let's accept the reality that something like Uber is here to stay. And that was somehow deemed some kind of an admission of something that was bad, as opposed to me just thinking it was a, a statement that accepted reality and said that these kinds of things are here and that one of the things we should spend our time doing instead of trying to put genies back into bottles is instead to be saying, let's focus on how we can help the people who need a hand up who've been affected by this. I was in the, the broadcasting business both laterally as a talk show host, which was kind of a weird thing I ended up doing. I'm not sure how that happened exactly. <laughs> Because I did go to law school and I was a practicing lawyer and I was the chief executive officer of a company, but I ended up as a talk show host. I could see, you know, when I was doing that, the impact that change was having on that industry and the number of job losses that took place in that industry. I, ca I can see it and continue to see it in the newspaper business. Uh, we could go on and on with the number of businesses that are being adversely affected, and I think if we focus our efforts in saying the solution to that rests ultimately in embracing change, including change that could bring some of those industries back in a new life, then that's part of the attitude change that has to take place. And I'm pleased to tell you that I think in government, in the financial institutions, in business, in the academic world, um, and in industries themselves that are being negatively affected by change, there is an increasing acceptance. I'll put it that way. It's not a joy. But there's an increasing acceptance that represents a change of attitude that says, not so much that if you can't fight them, join them, but just says, look, uh, we better accept reality because reality stares us in the face every day thanks to a lot of the work and a lot of the creativity and the intelligence that you have to bring new ideas forward and new ideas that, in fact, are going to make our life better. I worked for Ted Rogers uh, as a CEO in his companies for eight years. And Ted Rogers' entire mantra, and he was he wasn't himself a terribly techy person. In fact, you may not know this part about him, but his eyesight was so bad that he couldn't drive a car, and his eyesight was so bad he couldn't use a computer because he couldn't really see the monitor. So as a result, here was a man who never used the Internet, ever, but understood fundamentally where the Internet was going, and we had discussions with him, those of us who considered ourselves considerably better informed as a result of being users alone, where he was right every single time, proven that sometimes after his own death. But he believed that what he was doing by leading the kind of innovation that led to the advent of high-speed Internet and to various wireless products and so on and so on was making people's lives better. And if you think about it for a minute, that's exactly what those things did. You could argue about the cost. You could argue about the customer service and all those kinds of things. And you might well have a justifiable arguments to make. But the bottom line is the one thing that's not arguable is that those things made people's lives better. And the innovations that many of you are working on and that our tech community, our startup community are working on will in many different ways. Whether it's through the, today I was at Cisco for the opening of their innovation center, which is a hugely important vote of confidence they've made in Toronto and in you, in people like you. And they've, they've made hundreds, they're, they're investing hundreds of millions of dollars there, supported by the government of Ontario and supported by us. And they, one of the things they put on display today was a, 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 a remotely sort of monitored fire hydrant. Now you may say to yourself, of all the things, why would anybody bother with that? And I spoke about it today in front of the media when I was speaking and said, here's why these things matter if you're running a city or if you're just a person who's looking to have their life made better. If there's a fire in your house and the fire department just show up and they show up as quickly as they can, but the first thing they encounter when they get there is a frozen fire hydrant, it's going to take them maybe that one or two or three minutes to find some other place to get the water. And that could make the difference between safety for you and for your home or not. What they've developed is a fire hydrant that has a remote a sensor in it that measures the, the temperature in that fire hydrant and it, is, it can be remotely monitored on a continuous basis and sets off an alarm if the temperature drops below freezing. And it also measures at the same time the water pressure in that hydrant because, of course, the other thing that can happen even in summer is the fire department can show up and there's no water pressure and they can't fight the fire. And so you could give example after example after example. That's one of the ones they put on display today. But the bottom line is that we have to embrace this. This is the future. This is the future for the delivery of public services. This is the future in terms of enterprise. This is the future in terms of jobs. It's the future as well in terms of preserving the advantages and the critical mass we have in areas like financial services and life sciences and all the other industries that I could mention. Because if you look now, and it's starting to be written about more and more and more. I took Borowell and I forget two or three uh, startup companies with me to London. First of all, because the big companies don't need me to take 
them with me on missions to London to meet uh, people that I get access to. The small and medium sized and startup enterprises do because they don't know as many people. And so that's going to be a practice that I'll undertake in many of the trips that I take. And I will take trips around the world, notwithstanding that the man sitting around, I guess it's right around where you are, ma'am. That's the. R uh, let me just have a look and check because what a. It is. You are Rob Ford tonight. Congratulations. <laughs> but you know, Rob Ford will criticize me for going overseas and saying it's a terrible waste of time and money. I, I, I beg to differ. We've got to go out and sell the city and we've got to take people like that where I get access to the mayors of the world cities and some of the government leaders and business leaders and so on and take those people with me and saying, have you met my friend from Toronto? These are among some of the smartest people we've got in our town and there are thousands more like them at home. You should come over here and invest and live and do business and play and have a quality of life that's second to none. And so we're going to adopt this new approach and it's going to consist of taking advantage of and encouraging the Cisco's of the world to come here and establish their centers of innovation here. We were picked as one of nine cities on the globe in which there will be resident a, an innovation center like this. One of two cities in all of the Americas, the other one being in Rio. They could have gone to Chicago. They could have gone to Boston. They could have gone a lot of places. They came here. And we're going to continue one after another. There's a significant announcement being made tomorrow of another global company that is coming here to Toronto. And we've got to do that over and over again. And if I have to go anywhere, anytime, uh, on any flight at any hour of the day and take anybody with me I have to to get them to come here, I'm going to do that because, again, that's going to be part of a continuing successful ecosystem for startups is that these global companies with all of their reach and all of their expertise are there because what they said today, and I hope that we can hold them to it, I'm sure we'll be able to, is that they look at that place they've established out on the waterfront as a place where you will come and the financiers and the academics and the other governments and the bigger businesses to do things together that are going to make people's lives better and create new jobs and new enterprises and new wealth. And at the end of the day, what I started off talking about was which is those human problems that are being discussed downstairs are only going to be addressed in two ways. One is through employment. And so that as many people as we could have, including those who are marginalized in our, c in our city, and there are still far too many, can become successfully employed. But the second is through the creation of wealth. And the creation of wealth then can be fairly taxed by this and the other governments and directed to those kinds of priorities that will give those people a hand up to provide proper housing or to provide the kinds of training programs or language programs or whatever they need to succeed. And so we must continue to create wealth. And I think a lot of it is going to come in the years going forward beyond my tenure in this job from people like yourselves and the kinds of enterprises you're behind as opposed to what will still be a considerable source of wealth, namely the bigger companies uh, that are a resident here as part of that critical mass. I'll just finish with a note on this. And then I, I said I would take a couple of questions without totally screwing up your timetable, which I think I've already done. See, the advantage when you speak, you see that clock over there that has the timing on it, they start you on a time limit of five minutes. And almost no matter what you're speaking on here, the limit uh, under the rules is five minutes, and the clock counts down from five, or counts up to five minutes, and then the speaker politely or otherwise tells you that it's time to sit down. <laughs> um, thank God that clock is not running tonight. <laughs> Why do people come here? They come here because we've got the critical mass I talked about in various different businesses, and, and I, don't, I, I think we underestimate sometimes the successful critical mass we have here in terms of Toronto being a major global financial center, a major center for the life sciences and for some of the other food processing I could go on through a whole bunch of other industries. They come here because of our fabulous educational institutions. Minister Moridi, the f Provincial Minister of Innovation, uh, mentioned today at Cisco, and I hadn't heard this number before, 75% of the people of Ontario that live here have some post-secondary education, the highest rate of post-secondary education in the world. It's noticed. Many of you probably travel, so you know that fact, that people know, they're astounded at the excellence of our institutions and, more importantly, in a way, the excellence of the people who come out of those institutions. I'm going to make real. Um, the, uh, the, the Kitchener, Waterloo, Toronto corridor. It's referred to kind of as a buzz phrase now. We've got to make it real because it is real. It is real. The distance between Kitchener, Waterloo and Toronto is no different than the distance between Silicon Valley and San Francisco. But in our case, we've done less to tie it together as a corridor that is going to again be something we can take to the world as something that says this is a powerful reason to come here. Don't just come up here and hire people to take them somewhere else. Come up here and invest here. The people are here. They want to live here. Why do they want to live here? They want to live here because of the quality of life. 
They want to live here because of the quality of life. The number one most livable city in the world, the city of Toronto. Who would have thought that that would happen? Who would have thought that of all the cities in the world, this would be the number one most livable city in the world? The number one city, named by Citigroup in their research this year, the number one city in the world in terms of measured opportunity for young people going forward in the future. And so I think the combination of the talent, of the critical mass, of the educational institutions, uh, of, the, uh, of the opportunity that exists here is why people want to come here. And we have to convince them over and over again to come here because as they come, they will benefit you and me. We will benefit from their arrival here, whoever they are. If it's one person coming with an idea or a huge company coming to locate something new here like Cisco has done. And so I guess that is what I'm committed to do is to try and make that happen. The way we live together at the end of the day is the most fundamental part of this and that's why I'm so determined to see you successful because I want Toronto to be seen as a beacon for innovation, as a place that embraces change, the home of the game changers, the place where more game changers are invented than anywhere else in the world and nurtured and financed and commercialized where appropriate. But I want that as a means to an end because that's the only way in which we're going to be able to address those problems that I was hearing about half an hour ago downstairs. And I think that is what people admire about the city more so than anything else, is not so much just that we're a great place to do business and have talented, smart people and so on, but they look at us and they say, how is it you have all these people here who've come from all over the world and live peacefully together? At, at Cisco, again, today they mentioned that in their own office in Toronto, 87 different languages are spoken or represented in terms of where people have come from. What a great story that is. How proud that is for us, uh, how proud we can be of that. But if we want to keep it going, you are a big part of the answer to that. And so I don't presume to know it all. In fact, I know very little about all this. You know, I am sort of in that generation. I'm 61 years old. I'm the grandfather now, an aging grandfather. My grandchildren, I see them swiping screens on things when they're age two, and I'm sort of going, well, I'm still learning how to do that, and I'm 61. <laughs> but, you know, I know what I know, and I know what I don't know, and that's why I'm here, because I need your help in order to make what I've said a reality, the attitude change and the approach change that are necessary to make happen all that I've just talked about. And I know that you can do that with me and that I, I have a limited time in this job, but, but you are, many of you, younger than me, and you'll be here and you can work with everybody else to make this happen because it's something that's going to be continuous going forward. So I just want you to know I support you. I want to know what I need to do to support you more as the leader of the city government. I'm not working here alone. We have a big council that has to buy into this too, but I can be the leader, and I want to be the leader, and I'm committed to being the leader in this, uh, in this uh, process of change, which I think is so exciting for our city. So I'll thank you again for being here. I'll thank uh, Jason, and, and I, I just appreciate Jason and Alex, you're notwithstanding where you're sitting and some of those crazy ideas you've come forward with over time, <laughs> Giorgio. Um, but I just appreciate the fact you'd put this together, that the sponsors have helped out, and that you'd all take the time to be here, and I'm happy to answer a question or two to the best of my ability and the time that's available before they give me the hook. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, well, uh, we have time for three questions. So uh, I'm gonna take three questions here. Uh, if you are interested in asking a question, raise a hand. I've never taken questions from the mayor before, so uh, that's why I look a little bewildered. Uh, okay, here's my buddy Laszlo, go for it. Thank you. Uh, my question is that many times when a startup start growing and uh, kick off, um, they are usually bought out, out by American companies. They live in the country, they live in the city, they leaving the properties, leaving the country. What what's your take on it? What's your plan? Well, I mean, my own experience, perhaps uh, garnered more from when I was a lawyer or from when I was a business leader, is that they are leaving because they can't find, in many cases, the financing. Um, that uh, here to stay here and so somebody offers either to buy their business or even in some cases says I'll finance it and then the drift occurs to some other part of the world um, because of that financing or because of ownership and so I think part of the key to that and part of the reason why I believe so strongly in the sort of incubator and accelerator model as evidenced by a bunch that are here in the city but even the one that I was at today which really is the same thing the Cisco thing is because you've got in that room you had John Ruffalo there today speaking as somebody who works effectively for Omer's, one of the biggest pension plans in the world. And all the money's not gonna come from there, it's gonna, but it's, it's gonna come from sort of tiered levels of different financiers. But a lot of those people were there today too. Uh, one of the things I did when I was in London was went to see some of the people who were the financiers uh, that are going to help some of our startups as they help some of their own, because they're just looking for good ideas and good ways to make money. And I have no problem with that. So I think if there's a fundamental problem to be 
addressed, it is yes, to market ourselves so that a lot of these people who want to invest come here um, and, and look here as opposed to waiting around down there for us to move there. Um, and that we develop here our own, uh, I'll call it domestic um, marketplace, which I think really does exist. We just haven't sort of put the two together yet to make sure that we can either have Canadian ownership or uh, preferably, I would hope, Canadian financing for people who are the entrepreneurs and the original risk takers who can then take it to the next level and keep ownership of something and not have to sell it. The city government can't do much with tax money in that regard. I mean, the solution isn't going to come from government money. It's going to come from money that people choose to invest in these good ideas to keep these businesses here. We don't want to see a city venture fund. Well, I mean, we the city venture funds are, can be those kinds of things that can happen, but if you really look at the question what it was about something that sort of started and made it to the first level, that's not the kind of thing a city venture fund is going to invest in, and we don't have the money to do much anyway. I mean, in terms of like a, a, a fund of sufficient size and scale to really make the kind of difference that's going to address all the ideas that can come out of this room. Yeah, we need help. All right, we have a second question. Hello, thanks uh, for speaking, that was great. Um, I was here at an event probably in 2001 and 2002, which was an ICT related event, talking about how Toronto was third after San Francisco and New York, trying to get leaders in the city to um, take the next step. There was a talk about a lack of leadership, it was more practitioners in the design and tech space uh, at the time, and uh, we needed to improve leadership, and you know, we're having a lot of those same conversations here, and I think uh, one of the things that I struggle with is, is everybody who was at that event, um, which was about the same size as this, walked away and nothing was done. So my question is, how do the leaders of the community participate with what's happening with City of Toronto and the other uh, leaders in, in, in the uh, government sp space? How can we contribute? How can we uh, stay in touch and, and make sure these things are happening and we're supporting these initiatives? One of the things I will say, and I say it in all sincerity, not to be funny, that um, when you are at a stage in life that I'm at where you know you have a limited time, in my case, I've been told if I serve more than eight years in this job, if I can get reelected once, if I try to serve any more than that, I'll be living in a small apartment by myself. <laughs> it's, my, it's my wife that told me that, in case you were wondering. And so the incentive not to live in that small apartment says that I have a limited time horizon here, and I'm, by definition, because I work for T Ted Rod, just the nature of who I am, that I want to get these things done and actually see them happen. I'm not a great believer in making kind of speeches like the one I just made and saying, well, that was very nice and now I can just go home and sort of forget about it. And, but what's encouraging to me aside from the fact that I have an intense desire and, and a limited time in which to sort of see some of these things happen to the extent I can as one leader is a couple of things. Second, uh, first of all, some of the other leaders that are in governments today are committed to the same thing because they understand both that it's, it's going to be good for us and that it's going to be necessary for us to preserve our standard of living. Secondly, uh, I see people now in bigger business, for example, who are beginning to understand that one of the most important things they could do um, in terms of, uh, uh, of actually helping you to flourish is going to be not so much to sort of wait around and buy your business, in fact, not at all, but maybe offer a place where your ideas can be tested in, in a real setting, where some of the biggest companies here that can afford to take a risk, that can afford to allocate some time and resources actually say, fine, we will be a place that will work with the startup community and actually take their products, their apps, their this, their that, and, and be a place where they, can be, where they can be tested and piloted and guinea pigged and various things that have to be done. I sense that is actually now happening again. Sometimes, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, and I think a lot of these firms in the fintech area and so on understand they have to do that, but they're doing it. Um, I think that, um, uh, thirdly, I think there's maybe some self-confidence growing here now. You have to remember that between the time you mentioned 2001 and today, there was a punishing recession. And I think a lot of people kind of just went back into their shells and said, fine, I'm just going to run my bank and not worry too much about change. I think a lot of that is changing as we gain some self-confidence. The economy is still a bit rocky, but I think people have the self-confidence of understanding that, that we are good here. We are highly ranked for a reason. We have the talent pool here. We have smart people here. We don't have to sell all those businesses to somebody else. Um, we can do it here. And uh, I think there's been a changed attitude in business. I've seen the same change, for example, on affordable housing where I think business used to think of that as some kind of a social issue that was kind of over there for other people to worry about, they now realize it's a profound economic issue. If people can't afford to live here, that you need to have in jobs that sometimes don't get paid that much, then you're going to be in trouble in terms of running your business because there are people in your business that will be in that lower income bracket and they need to have a place to live. And so I think businesses I've seen are starting to sort of figure that out now and it's changed their attitude. So I'm optimistic. I think the governments, the academic world, 
the business community are operating in partnership like I've never seen before, and they understand you represent the future. And you represent the future growth opportunities for the big companies, and I think that, uh, and the governments in turn need the, the revenue to do what they do from successful uh, companies, and I think it's, it's, it's dawned on everybody that this is what, what the answer is going to be going forward. Last question goes to who? So if we are successful at turning Toronto and the area into another tech hub like Silicon Valley, uh, what can we do to address the runaway gentrification problem that San Francisco has run into? The runaway gentrification problem that San Francisco has run into. It, it, I mean, it's a conundrum, and I guess I was just alluding to it by talking about, uh, about you know, affordable housing, I mean, for example, and it, it's a conundrum. I mean, you know, as this city has gone through what has been a tremendous run of the last 10 years in terms of success on many different fronts, and as it has boomed in terms of development, um, it has become more and more and more and more expensive in every respect, whether you're talking about just housing of any kind, whether you're talking about commercial space, and so on. And I don't have any simple answers to that to say, well, fine, the government will somehow subsidize everything to make it better for people, or we will, you know, I think we can, we, I think what we have to do more so than anything else is be aware of these things and to try to work again with the private sector and others to develop solutions for things like affordable housing, for uh, accommodations. I mean, what John Ruffalo was describing to me today that he's working on over by the CN Tower is an incredibly exciting thing that will provide for a, a, a good, I believe, affordable environment for a lot of people that are in the business that you're in uh, going forward. And I think that's that kind of thing repeated over and over again is going to be very important. But I don't have an answer to that question. When you're successful in a free market uh, kind of economy, the logical result of that, one of the logical results is that it pushes up um, the value of being in that place. And uh, so all we have to do, I think, is be aware of it and listen to people like yourselves as to what we can do. If you look at some of the ideas we've adopted for artists, and I would argue that artists are really no different, they're creative people that we need to have in the city. We have developed now housing developments. I've been proud to go to the groundbreaking of two or three that include specific affordable housing allocated to people who are artists. Um, we have tried to start uh, using some of our creativity to address the space needs of artists, to space to do their work, I mean, as opposed to living space. And, um, you know, I've even got an idea in my head. We have right now, we, we pay a rebate right now to um, stores that are vacant, to the landlords of those stores. Well, that can serve as a disincentive to ever rent the store out. Why wouldn't we say, well, look, we'll give you one rebate if you just leave the store empty. We'll give you another higher rebate if you agree to make some of your space that's vacant available to startups uh, on, a, a, on a reasonable rent. And we will then give you an even, an even better thing. So they may not be able to pay much rent, uh, but they uh, will make a better rebate for you if you follow what I'm saying. I said that awkwardly. But these are the kinds of things I think we're going to have to do to try and keep the city affordable for startups. And I think we can do it. And I think it's an awareness that has to be among our leaders, all of them, business, academic, uh, government, that there is this problem of what you referred to as gentrification and that that's going to chase some people away. Uh, and you know what happened? They'll simply go somewhere else, including in Ontario. Um, and I want them here. Because uh, I think the sort of the, what's the word I'm looking for, the overall kind of uh, working together of all this will create an effect that I think is going to make us even better 10 years from, uh, from now than we are today. I thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for taking more time than I was allocated. Um, and uh, you can see now I did a talk show. It answers my own question. <laughs> but uh, I thank you very much. And I, I will stay for a bit, and then I'm going to try to get back down to hear some more of those deputations downstairs. But I thank you for what you're doing to build a great city, both in terms of our quality of life and our economy. I thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, John, before you head back down to solve uh, human problems, uh, we want you to remember that we can solve them with technology. Uh, so we'd love to present you with this Tech Toronto shirt All right. uh, for you to wear. In, uh, is it a large? Yeah. If it's a large, I'll put it on right now. He's going for it. <laughs> keep, the, keep the dress shirt on, though, John. Oh, i got to do okay. that. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> George Hermann Lee did that one time, too. Okay. <laughs> Close off in here. That's awesome. And, and a reminder for the community um, that if there are problems that we think need solving in the city, it is, um, you know, it is up to us to create an app for that. Okay? So we will not just rely on city government. We will build it uh, ourselves as well. Sound good? Okay. We do, you look, he looks great. He looks, he looks awesome. <laughs>